Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Story Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Good evening. And welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Mike Maurer, deputy chief of staff to Governor Gary Herbert, Amanda Dixon, co-host of Utah's Morning News on KSL Radio, and Representative Brian King, House Minority Leader. So glad to have you all here with us today. We're going to start talking about the legislative session a little bit and some things happening locally and nationally. But Representative, we're going to start with you for a moment. We've talked about bills that passed on the show. We love doing that. Sometimes we like to do a little session wrap-up where we talk about how people did, how legislators did in passing bills. And here's one interesting thing. We know that there is sort of a super majority of Republicans, but you are the super minority leader. I, I, thank you for calling me the super minority leader. I'm not the minority leader. I'm the super minority leader. Yes, you are, you are indeed. He is. And I bring that up because there was a lot of bipartisanship in terms of the bills that were passed this year. You've been talking about it in some of the reports recently and the articles. Why is that? And explain kind of how Democrats are having such a good uh, role to play in the legislature and being so successful. Well, I think that Democrats have an important role in the sense that there are many bills, especially the controversial ones, where the Democrats make the difference between whether the bill passes or not. And we know that, and uh, the Republicans know that, and they oftentimes involve us in those con conversations about the best approach and the best way forward. SB 54, for example, is a good example of a bill that time and time again has passed the legislature only because the Democrats hung together and supported it. So that kind of uh, collaboration and work across the aisle is very common up at the Utah State Legislature. Statistically, about 85% of the bills have bipartisan mm -hmm. support. And uh, that's very different than Congress, where you have a percentage of about 25% of the bills have bipartisan support. Well, Mike, address this, because I looked up at these numbers. In the House, 94% of the House voted together during this <laughs> session, 97% of the Senate. How, do, do you expect it to be that high? Well, it, it has historically been there. I've, I've been up there for well over a decade, and it, that's kind of been the pattern in Utah. We have a system set up. I think it's a wonderful system. 45 days, you're in, you're out. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the time, if a bill isn't supported, uh, it'll just kind of quietly die in committee, it'll die in the other body. And so what comes to the floor often is something that's been pre-vetted in a couple of committee hearings and generally has support. So historically, what you see this year isn't all that different from what we've had over the past several years in mm -hmm. Utah. Uh, Amanda, you interviewed so many people during the session. I love listening to it in the mornings. What is your sense of this bipartisan approach, even though people don't really think that we, we have much bipartisanship. I was so surprised the first time I heard that 85% number that Republicans and Democrats vote the same to that extent. I think most people would be surprised to mm -hmm. know that. Mm -hmm. and. I, that's got to be so much higher than it is in other yeah, places well, in the it's, country. It's, it's also a reflection of the fact that many, many of the bills simply aren't partisan. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about, about the, the utilities yeah. and the things that, that are, don't, don't lend themselves to, right. to controversial not, sorts of right. subject right. matters. That's right. But I think it's, it's also a compliment to, to our members of the mm -hmm. legislature that are working to get things done and aren't letting the, the partisan sort of issues yeah. drive their votes. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's interesting, I think, on this, Jason, is that you'll find many times that your best friend on Friday or Monday afternoon <laughs> at 5 p.m. when you're finishing up the final vote for the day on the floor is your biggest enemy the next morning in terms of being opposed to you on the next bill on the calendar, on the, on the roll call. So, I, I, it's interesting that we know each other well personally, regardless of what party we're in. There are times when you even forget what party people are in. And, and you start thinking about allies. I mean, I will commonly, and I know that this is true for the Republicans and Democrats in the Senate too, I'll commonly, more often than not, ask for a Republican to be my Senate sponsor of a bill that I send over to the Senate once it's passed the House. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine mm -hmm. someone in Washington forgetting what party <laughs> they're in? That's, right. that, that's unimaginable to me. Well, and it's a key. We like to use the phrase Utah nice, but, but I think there is something to that, that there is a collegiality, that there's a respect, that there is seldom the personal animus between members that spills out into the public like you see in Washington. I mean, we always talk about, Governor Herbert will often talk about Utah being 
example to Washington. I think the way our legislature works together with the executive branch is an excellent example of, of how things should be done in Washington. Well, let, let's hit this theme of this Utah Nice, right? Uh -huh. Because this was in the paper this morning. I think Adam Brown's doing some work right. on this. So Utah Nice means maybe that we don't go after each other as openly as you might right. in some kind of places. But it doesn't mean we don't kill bills. Right. Mike, how do we kill bills? And because this seems to be the way to do it, right? We don't do it up front, we do it from the back. Well, and what we'll do, you know, a lot of times people look at the governor and say, hey, you didn't veto more bills. Part of that is we put in a lot of work in the executive branch and legislators do the same thing in making sure that bad bills don't reach his desk. That if there's a problem, mm. if, if there's an unintended consequence, that those uh, end up in, in one committee or one body and they don't move forward. And legislative leaders have historically been good to realize, you know, maybe this, maybe this issue isn't ready for prime time. Maybe we need to mm. do a little more thorough review. So at the end of the day, the governor only, you know, like 90% of the bills that reach his desk were passed unanimously or almost near unanimously. There are very few bills that, that, that require a deep dive, I should mm. say percentage-wise, uh, very few bills at the end of the session that require a really deep dive. Mm. He'll still do a thorough review of every single bill, but there's maybe 15 or 20 where individuals from the public have said, hey, please take a second look at this. Please consider this for a veto. Representative, give us the process a little bit, how that can be the case. Because if that's really the answer, most of these come and they're they're pretty uniform in terms of their support, that means a lot of stuff's getting filtered out. Yeah, no, there is a lot of stuff being filtered out. And I think there's a lot of self-filtering in the sense that t sometimes you'll have a bill idea that you have, somebody comes to you with, maybe a constituent, maybe it's your own bill idea. And it involves a state agency in some fashion or another. And you go to the state agency and you say, hey, here's my bill idea. And they look at you and they say, well, you need to know this, that, and the other. And you go, oh, well, maybe it's not such a good bill idea after all. And they'll say, yeah, maybe it's not such a good bill idea. So there's a lot of self-filtering. There's a lot of filtering that comes from our legislative office of research and general counsel. They do in their drafting. They'll come at, back to us and give us problems with bills when we come to them with ideas. So I think that happens. We also hear from the governor uh, and, and his people occasionally about various things. I heard from uh, the governor's general counsel this session about a particular bill and expressing concerns. And, you know, they'll let us know when they have heartburn about something. Mm -hmm. And you listen to it? Well, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say they listen. They don't always so, do what we'd like, but they're willing to listen. So how did and forgive me because mm -hmm. I know I know I don't have the background in this area. All I know is what I heard representative from so many of of our listeners. How did the transportation bill get through with that suggestion that the name uh, that UTA's name be changed with the suggestion that it might cost $50 million. We know it might not cost that. Right, it yeah. might cost it's half be, that. Yeah. It may be a tenth of that. Well, but but why change the name at all is what I hear unanimously yeah. from the public. No, uh, that's a good question, and I don't know how and why you had the name change getting incorporated into the statute. That struck me as being very odd. Yeah. But I thought, you know what, that's a relatively small thing when we're talking about some of the really big vision, big picture items that are in that bill. The $50 million is an illusion that there's nothing in the bill that says that they will or have to spend $50 million, and in fact, I don't think you're going to spend anything near that. Uh, but I do think but they could. They could, and that's a problem. I didn't like that pa aspect of the bill, but as with so many bills, you know, you take the stuff that you don't like and it's this high, and you take the stuff that you do like and it's that high, and you go, I'm going to vote for it. And that's mm -hmm. what I did with that transportation mm -hmm. bill. Mm -hmm. Give us some of the inner workings on this one, Mike. Well, this is one that uh, we worked uh, closely with the legislature, uh, but it was a process that they had been involved with all summer long. We like to think the legislative session is 45 days, which it is, but we have interim committees and special committees in the mm -hmm. legislature that work year round. This was one of those bills where they had worked year round on this bill to say, we have some challenges with UTA, with, with the governance structure, with the funding structure. As a state, we realize we're headed to 6 million people in the next 50 years. How are we going to better merge our trans, uh, transportation entities and options? And it was taking the steps now, uh, and this bill did that, to help see us through the next 50 years when it comes to meeting our transportation needs. What kind of pressure is the governor's office getting now on this particular bill? We've had a lot of people that have called, but it's almost all tied to the the kind of the information that went out or misinformation went out that there'd be a $50 million cost associated the name change. And the governor's expressed concern similar to what Representative King said about that. Uh, 
very few calls on regarding the substance or the governance structure change or the mm -hmm. way the transit funding will take place. So it's kind of, I, I can appreciate for the public, you've got a lot of issues coming at you in 45 days mm -hmm. and they're hot for a day and then they're resolved mm -hmm. and then you kind of move on to another one. And so that one was one that went out there, but I think is being resolved over time as people realize we're not spending $50 million to rebrand UTA. I, I That's think what, crazy. if anybody, you know, woke up tomorrow and saw a different lettering on a bus and yeah. bought any money at all. Yeah. They want more buses, right, yeah. more routes. Right. That's all. They just want the bus to show up when they need to get right. to work. Right. That's all they care about, don't you think, Mike? Right. Well, it, you, and you want an integrated transportation system. Yes. I, I mean, for everybody who's on the freeway, we just expanded the freeways dramatically, and they're full again. Mm -hmm. And in part, that's due to our you know, great economic well, growth, Mike, but it all ties together. And Mike, that's what I saw as the big upside of that bill, mm -hmm. is that this is, the for the first time in state history, a significant commitment with a fiscal infrastructure for funding mass transit right. on, an, on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis into the future in a way that's really going to benefit Utahns. It's a hu here's something no one talks about with that bill, Jason. This is a huge clean air bill. Right. Huge. Yes. Right. You can make an argument that this is the right. maybe the second or third biggest clean air bill that we've ever passed behind only tier three gasoline. Mm -hmm. Because half the emissions that we get come out of tailpipes. Well, if you can make a significant movement in the step of mass transit and getting people out of their cars, hmm. you're going to clean up the air. And that okay. got lost. It yeah. did get lost. Got yeah. lost. It got lost, lost entirely. Yeah. It got lost in the $50 million right. Right. painting of the Which buses. is too bad, because this is, you know, the governor started out this session saying, we, we need to address some 100-year problems. You know, let's look at 100 years. Transportation is certainly part of that. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, at the end, where we all should have been celebrating, hey, this is really cool long term, it got caught up on, on right. that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that mm -hmm. number. Okay, let's get into some conversation about these legislators themselves. They okay. tackled some tough bills, but wow, we got a lot of legislators that are not running again. Mm -hmm. 20 members of our legislature either are running at for- least. A, 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 That we know of, right? So well, this, we, I, you say not running again, but what you're gonna see are some people who don't come back because they get defeated. The number of new legislators that we're gonna see, I think is gonna be up around 25 or maybe more. What that, will that be like? Uh, it'll be, well, we've had big changes in the past. This but, is, we were, Mike is, uh, I agree on this point about it illustrates the fact that we don't need term limits because there's a natural turnover in the Utah mm -hmm. State Legislature uh -huh. that's very healthy. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, is that what this is, Mike? Do you think is this a natural turnover? Because some of these people are going out saying, I'm kind of upset. Well, I think, you know, you'd have to look at an individual basis. Each person has their reason for running again or not running again. Uh, we've, we have some terrific legislators that are retiring. We have, I'll say this, we have some wonderful people that serve in the state legislature. They don't get the credit they, they often deserve and, and often they get more blame. They work extremely hard. Uh, Kevin Van Tassel, for example, Senator from Vernal, he's, he's been in the state Senate for two terms. He has driven 700,000 miles awesome. to and from yeah. Vernal to the state capitol wow. for years, attending meetings and, and doing town halls back in his district. It's an incredible sacrifice to be a legislator. And you've got to put in, in often your career on hold yeah. and you've got family <clears throat> growing up and you're missing a lot of their events. So, you know, for each one, it's a personal reason why they're not running, but we have, we work with some incredible people on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amanda, what are your callers saying about this turnover? You know, I, I haven't heard specifically on that turnover, but you know what I wonder, Jason, is I wonder if we'll see a, an influx of young people mm -hmm. into this process and maybe maybe we are already. I, I, I hosted an event at, at the Capitol right before the session started this year of millennials. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to explain to them that in order to be engaged in the political process, you must do more than post. <laughs> <laughs> Posting is not engagement in the political process. Uh -huh. You must A, vote. That's necessary. Yes. <laughs> and then, you know, it'd be great if you went to a caucus. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be great. And, and then you actually could run. I don't see mm -hmm. why you insist on having people interact with each other. Face to face. You're talking about face to face I, stuff. I know. But these, these, and too these much young to people for. are too much. they are passionate yes. about issues. Mm -hmm. And we uh, some of the members of the of the uh, legislature were there telling yeah. them, you all are the largest um, you know, you're the largest generation right now. You could change any issue. 
-hmm. You could change any election yeah. if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Your power is enormous. Use it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they will here in the yeah. state of Utah, but they are, I guess, in some parts of, of the country. Is that yeah. what you that, feel? That's, that's exactly what, what we're saying. And and, this, and the people who are filing right now, and for representative, I'm kind of curious about this session yeah. too, because you already have some some younger yeah. representatives yeah. coming into yeah. the House mm -hmm. that had some significant legislation this right. session. Right, and and some of them are leaving. I'm thinking of Justin Foss, and who's oh. relatively young, and he's leaving yeah. because his wife got a job. They're yeah. moving out of state. Oh. We've got some great. Uh, I'm familiar with many of the Democrats, Democratic candidates who have filed for the House because I'm working closely with them to see if we can't get them elected and there are some great young candidates that have filed and that are coming along and I'm excited about well it. how do you think they're going to change the makeup of our legislature I think we're going to see more women in the next legislature and I think that'll be a good mm -hmm. thing I think it'll be more Republicans I hope I, I think we'll see as many or more Democrats uh, being elected who are women as we've seen in the past right now our Democratic House caucus has 13 people nine of whom are women hmm. so uh, I don't think that's going to change. I think we'll have that percentage of women or more. Hmm. Very interesting. We'll watch that. Some of the kind of decision making that goes into running for office depends on some things happening with the Repu Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Democrats are not having this particular issue right now. Not Rep yet. Representative King, but, <laughs> yeah. but it may. But Mike, let's talk about what happened with the Central Committee, uh, with this change and how it is kind of rippling through the decision making process for people want to be in office to gather signatures or to go through the caucus convention system? Well, <clears throat> some are doing both, uh, but it, it has been confusing. And it's one where it's, you know, continually changing based on, you know, based on if a lawsuit's being filed or how something's being interpreted. It's one where, uh, to, to not add to the confusion, I'm just going to say refer to whatever our lieutenant governor does. Mm -hmm. And our lieutenant governor, Spencer Cox, is, is also the head of the elections office. He's going to be the one that's going to have to make a lot of those final calls after th whichever recognized party entity, you know, weighs in. So okay. it's, it's, it's. It's confusing. Well, let me put up a graphic because mm -hmm. I want to get your kind mm -hmm. of comments on this from the lieutenant governor. He said this week, this is about the Central Committee, right. this is a very dangerous game they're playing. To openly defy the law is extremely risky. Mm -hmm. So you said follow lieutenant governor. That yeah. is yeah. pretty some pretty harsh stuff right you know, there. Although we, we hear uh, frequently from people who say it, the, a party is a... A, a separate entity and it ought to be able to do whatever it wants. I mean, mm -hmm. these are the kinds of texts mm -hmm. that I have read right. frequently from listeners. So I, I wonder where where does that play in, in terms of the law? Are they a separate entity that ought to be able to make their own rules and do whatever they want? Mm -hmm. Or does the law trump that? There's a lot of tension there. So, there's a lot of tension yeah. there. Well, because because I think there's a good argument to be made that the party should be able to say, here's who we, as a governing structure within the party, will allow to run as a Democrat or as a Republican. Mm -hmm. I get that argument. Yeah. You don't want just anybody coming in and saying, well, I'm going to run this way or that way. And should the necessarily. state decide that or should the party decide exactly. that? Exactly. That's the and, and a source of tension. What, what often yeah. ends up happening is the courts will end up deciding it. So hopefully we can come together. Mm -hmm. I'll just encourage everybody to go to the caucus of your choice on March 20th. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a, a very key part of our governance structure here. So whether you're a Democrat or Republican or independent American or libertarian, you know, we just say to your viewers on uh, Tuesday night, go to the caucus of your Amen choice. Amen to that. Yeah, that is a good mean. plug, no matter what party <laughs> you are in. But mm -hmm. let's talk uh, for a moment about what Rob Anderson did. Representative, mm -hmm. I want to get your idea here because he has to submit the bylaws to the lieutenant governor mm -hmm. and he did not submit this week this policy change. Right. I mean, this shows the degree of dysfunction within uh, Utah's Republican Party that the Central Committee makes the change and the chair of the, of the party says, no, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so you know, I don't know. I, it might end up in litigation. Yeah. That wouldn't surprise me at all. And we'll mm -hmm. see what the courts have to say. But for the time being, Rob Anderson is saying, Listen, we're going to comply with the law. Yeah. Period. End of story. So now, who runs the, the who runs the party? Rob mm -hmm. Anderson or the Central Committee? Mm -hmm. That is the question. So, is this really just aimed at getting some uh, litigation on this particular issue? You think that's where this group, uh, the I'm, Central Committee, I'm really wants to go? I'm hoping it works out, and it's one where, as I say, I'm not here as a representative of the Elections Office 
or of, of Rob Anderson or of the State Central Committee or of any of the you know myriad players in this issue. Mm -hmm. This is one that's going to have to be played out um, with the Lieutenant Governor and uh, with the authorized Republican mm -hmm. Party representative. Well, how is it playing out with the candidates now? So well, the candidates I'm decision. talking to, uh, Republican candidates, a lot of them are gathering signatures and they're going through the traditional caucus convention route. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think they're they're making sure they're they're covered both ways depending on what happens. So is it confusing? Yes, it's confusing. Is that disappointing? Yeah, it's disappointing. Mm -hmm. Every candidate has to make their own choice. When I filed earlier this week, I made the choice and I thought about it as I as my little pen was poised over the paper. <laughs> I thought no one has filed against me within my party and they may never file against me, but there's still time for them to do that. Do I want to elect both to run within the caucus and gather signatures mm -hmm. or just stay within the caucus? You so know, I stayed within the caucus. Right. But That's what you my, decided. Yes. Okay. My question is, as just someone who would who would want to encourage any and all people to run, why would any party, the Republicans or Democrats or any party, want to discourage anyone from running? Wouldn't you want to do? Yeah. Wouldn't you want to have your rules mm -hmm. be such? I ask, so that you would encourage any and all people to come to the process. Mm -hmm. That's my question. Okay. Well, what are people saying to you when they're calling in with this younger generation that you talked about, which you gave a very good plug, why they should stay involved? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When these things are so confusing, sometimes it's very contentious. Is this turning them off? Are they? They would be frustrated by this, mm -hmm. I'm quite sure. And w when they express their frustration on Facebook, I would say, go to the caucus. <laughs> <laughs> express your frustration there, because Facebook is not going to get you anywhere. <laughs> well, uh, there are some who are listening. Uh, yeah. This week, uh, on Wednesday, a national kind of march of sorts, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. Children and schools all over the country are, are walking out in solidarity for mm -hmm. 17 minutes. Man, t talk about what's happening here, and let's see the impact yes. in Utah. It, uh, it's really something, isn't it? How And schools are allowing them this space, not requiring it. It's not something where teachers have planned curriculum in most mm -hmm. cases, although I think there are some cases where they have. But they're allowing a safe space for the students to go to a football field or a gymnasium and be together and talk. Um, not all students want to go. Some do not. And I. I think it's it's a much better way we're handling it than say Texas, mm -hmm. where in Texas, students who uh, decided to walk out in some cases were actually punished. That's the plan in Texas. They decided this is not something that, that we condone. And so as a school district or an individual school, w we've decided that that is something that we can mm -hmm. uh, take action against a student for. That didn't look like the right way, from my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good thing. This is school safety is an issue, a school issue that students, I think, should have a right to mm -hmm. talk to each other about and to express themselves. And you know, my my seventh grader, uh, he came home last night and said, "So we might be walking out for 17 minutes." Wish he had not brought that up in front of my youngest son, <laughs> because I had not talked to him about it yet. But that oh, cat was out of the bag then. Mm -hmm. So we talked about what happened in the most tender way we could, and it was it was good to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I think it's both an important subject matter to have a conversation about, of course. And I also think that energizing and mobilizing our kids and having them self-mobilize yeah. is really critical because tying into this whole thing that we've been talking about in terms of political involvement and activity and awareness, that's a critical component. When you have something happening to a kid when they're in uh, you know, junior high or high school or even elementary school, it can change and shape the way they view mm -hmm. their desire to be involved in political activities the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. I remember very distinctly the Watergate hearings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was in 1972 yeah. and I was a kid, I was like 12 years old and watching this on TV, talking about it around the dinner table. That's the kind of thing that I credit with ha causing me to have a really active involvement and interest in politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of impact do you think these students are going to have? Well, I, I think it'll be a right. seminal event for them. I think they'll remember for a long time. We respect their, you know, their freedom of speech rights and their freedom of assembly uh, uh, rights. And it, it'll be interesting to see. The question is, will they do what you've said to do? And that is follow up. If you're 18 and you're a high school student, will you go to the caucus meeting of your choice on Tuesday night? Uh, that's the key thing is there's a momentary concern. What are you going to yeah. do long term? All right. We'll watch this one closely. Thank you yeah. for your comments today. Are we really done? We're really done. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for tonight's show. This weekend, KUED's membership drive comes to a close. 
Your support keeps programs like this one on the air. So please take a moment to make a donation. And thank you to everyone who supports the Hinkley Report and KUED. We'll see you next week. Good night.